As we begin our new Lenten series in God's name, we are going to read from today's sermon text from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. And this is uh, what's traditionally known as uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and these are the, the earlier uh, ones that are listed that particularly pertain uh, towards God. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. The word of the Lord. I was planning for the season of Lent and trying to discern what topics are both um, true to the text, true to our tradition, and speak to the world that we are living in and uh, sometimes in conflict with and sometimes struggling how to understand. And I was thinking about, if I were to ask you what are the central themes or the central messages of Lent and that path towards Easter, and you were to make a list, I would guess maybe some things that you might answer, things like sacrifice or forgiveness or life and death, uh, faithfulness, there, those kinds of themes I feel like would probably come to the front. But something that I imagine either doesn't make the list at all or gets way down on that list is blasphemy. Uh, blasphemy, something that you say or do that disrespects God or God's name. And it, it's interesting to me that it's something we don't really talk about that much, but blasphemy is a central part of the story of Jesus, of the story of the Gospels, of the story of the cross and resurrection. Uh, Jesus' execution order, from religious authorities comes about because Jesus is being charged with blasphemy. And so it is wound up deep into the story of who Jesus is, of what does it mean to say uh, who God is? What does it mean to say what God is at work in the world doing? And so it matters how we talk about God and how we talk about the way God operates in the world. Now, what I think that is probably true of your experiences as well as mine is when I grew up, I was always under the impression that blasphemy was about not using certain phrases. Don't say that. And so there were lists of phrases, maybe OMG, or just saying Jesus, or oh God, or all sorts of phrases in which you're like, you better say that in the right way. And if you aren't, it's like it's like a low-level profanity or something. You know, it's like you, you've said some phrase, some, some, some naughty word or something. But blasphemy is so much more than just your vocabulary choices. Uh, how we talk about God, how we invoke God and the way God operates in the world has much bigger uh, effects than just our language. Um, we, we probably all would, would admit that people invoke God on every side of any stance, of any issue, uh, that people have, have gone into wars knowing for certain for themselves. God is, of course, on my side. Uh, and you can look in our own history of people on both sides of the Civil War in the 1860s invoking that God was on their side. People on both sides of the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s believing God is on their side about uh, segregation and integration. Um, that we all tend to use God to puff up our own platforms, our own sides of whatever things we are going through. And so people have blasphemed God by invoking God's support of crusades or unjust wars. People have blasphemed God about supporting abuse or covering up abuse. People have blasphemed God about um, saying that God doesn't support or have dignity like for some people, whether it's the poor or those who are uh, immigrants or those who are most vulnerable. And people have all sorts of judgments about who God's on the side of and who God is not and who God is judging and so we blaspheme God in all sorts of ways, and we say God is, is attached to all sorts of things that might actually turn out to be injustice and wicked. 
And so blasphemy is going to be is so much more, and we're going to see throughout this series on Lent the different ways that it, it's at work in our Bible and in our lives. And so with that backdrop, when we read Exodus 20, when we read these Ten Commandments that, that we traditionally call that way, um, we're getting these, these commands of how God is talking about how you stay in this covenant relationship that I've given you. And it's in that context that you get this, you know, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. And so, like, if you feel like blasphemy is low on your list, like, it's also a part of the Ten Commandments. You know, and we kind of know it, but it doesn't actually make its way to the top of our internal most important list to think about. Um, it's hard enough to know, am I speaking rightly about God? And this is like a preacher's dilemma. Every week, you're talking about who God is. And there's a struggle with that of like, as much prayerful consideration of, here is the God who's revealed to us in Scripture, uh, who is experienced in daily devotion and worship. Here's how that God is operating in the world. It, it's not easy to speak about who God is and what God is doing without being opened up to the potential of violating this command of speaking wrongly and misusing God's name. And as hard as it just is in general, I want us to think about how hard it must be for the Hebrew people in this Exodus 20 story. If it's hard enough to speak about God correctly, what about when you don't hardly know anything about God? Like they're just encountering God. They're just getting commands. They're just getting a covenant. And they're told, you got to speak right about God. It's like, wait, who is this God I'm supposed to speak rightly about? And the Exodus 20 chapter begins with, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So that's their experience that they know. Okay, God is a liberating God. I can feel confident there. But what can I say about God? What shouldn't I say about God? Uh, they're about to venture into a journey in which they will sometimes do right and sometimes do wrong about God how they talk about God. But the less we know about God, the more likely we are to fall into mistakenly invoking God's name in ways that are, that are blasphemy, that are disrespectful of who God actually is. And so one of the calls uh, to learn about God and to know God is to how better to speak about God, how to better speak about God to those around you and to those in this world. And so I hope that as we go through this series that you might find new ways to understand um, how blasphemy comes out in the text and in our own lives. But it might be helpful to just remind ourselves of the call to, to go to God, to learn from God, because we have to know who God is to rightly talk about God. And so uh, one of the things that if you've got a Lenten devotional guide, if you've seen my intro, I talk a little bit about the history of Lent and the history of Ash Wednesday. Um, I think it matters to know why these practices emerge. Why do people even celebrate Lenten? What does that mean? Uh, you might go down a, a path of, wait, what does Lent mean? And if you're an English speaker and you're like, what is Lent? What is the definition of Lent? And it says like Old English for spring. You're like, well, I know that the origins of this can't be Old English. <laughs> so that's, that's not leading me anywhere that's going to help me understand what the season's about. Uh, but the season of Lent in our historical record um, emerges at least people discussing it, people talking about its practice around the 300s. So about 300 years after Christ. And it was a, a unique moment in history. For 300 years, Christians faced potential persecution. It wasn't like every single day, all of the time you're being persecuted, but if you experienced it one day of your life, you're afraid that it's going to come again. If your parents experienced it, you're growing up with a little fear that if people um, know I'm Christian, maybe they're going to think I'm not patriotic to my Roman Empire. Maybe I don't want to worship uh, Caesar. Maybe uh, I, I, they, they called early Christians atheists because they didn't believe in the kind of polytheistic gods of society. Um, and so if they find me out, I might get persecuted. And so you weren't just like Christian just because, well, it's cool to do. <laughs> like you had to choose this life. It was something that you had to be faithful for. And, and the struggle in those 300 years was on moments of persecution when some people denied Christ to avoid persecution. 
Well, what do we do with those people when they come back? Because being faithful matters so much. Well, if you fast forward to the 300s, suddenly Christianity is in a place of power. And you've got Emperor Constantine who comes to power uh, invoking uh, the sign of the cross and invoking God as a, a part of his war. And he doesn't make Christianity the official religion, but he makes it favored. So if you can imagine, um, you know how lobbyists work? When you're making a tax plan and suddenly somebody gets a benefit, Christians start getting those fringe benefits. They start getting special treatment. And so things are changing. And by 380, suddenly Emperor Theodosius makes a rule that Christianity is now the official religion of the Roman Empire. We are the religion of the empire. And that makes a new moment because suddenly every kind of entrepreneurial spirit suddenly has more motivation to become a Christian. Like, it's going to get me a place of power. It's going to get me a place at the seat at this next table. And, and so Christians start looking around and be like, I don't recognize this faith. Like, how do I be faithful? Like, what is it to follow God? And suddenly people are invoking God's name and all these weird things. And you're like, I, I don't think that's what God's about. And so you had some Christians who start fleeing to the wilderness and start making monasteries with monks and nuns because they're like, there's got to be a more committed path than what I'm seeing in the world. Uh, but you also see this church kind of calendar thing that starts with the season of Lent. Uh, the original name is just a, a fancy Greek word that means 40th, or a Latin word that means 40th. And it was just a 40-day season where they're like, we're going to be intentional about getting to Easter. Because Easter is easy in the sense of like, it's nice to celebrate life and hope. But like, when all of popular Christianity just wants all the fringe benefits but doesn't want the hard work of being faithful in the midst of temptations and trials, um, let's commit to that path of Jesus' wilderness temptations of being faithful. Let's commit to what the path is that leads to a cross. And it's this intentional desire um, to mean something when we say that we follow Christ, to mean something when we invoke who God is, and not just in the popular sense, but in a faithful sense. And so we are invited on Ash Wednesday to be reminded that we have said things that aren't living up fully to who God is. We've invoked God in ways that we've later realized, oh, I don't think that was God's intention there. I don't think that's who God was. And we are called to a, a more committed, more faithful path of speaking true about who God is and living that out. Because blasphemy is not just about words, it's about our actions and our behaviors and the way we live in the world. Uh, are we living out the reality of who God is? And so maybe today as you reflect on this day, uh, on this Ash Wednesday and this call to repentance, this call to be reminded in which life is, is, is short in the cosmic scheme, but, uh, but there's hope even for the, the ashes, even for uh, the dust of the earth that has given life. And so is there any area in your life that speaks wrongly about God? Maybe that's a moment to confess, to repent of. Is there any area in which you've acted in ways that disrespect who God is? It's an opportunity to repent. Is there anything that we've declared unclean that God has declared clean? Is there anything we've declared righteous that God has declared unrighteous? Let's enter into the season with some introspection, some thoughtfulness about how we talk about God and how we live after God's way of life. So no matter what you've done, today is the opportunity to enter onto that journey. Uh, no matter whether uh, this is like kind of continuing status quo for you, of like, man, I've been, I've been trying to be faithful for so long, uh, but this is just a new opportunity to take on some extra, um, some extra reflection time or whatever it is. But maybe like, like, I've ran from God, I've hid from God, I've been like Jonah, I've gone the other direction, and this is an opportunity to turn towards God afresh. May this season be one in which God's uh, loving, liberating power is felt for you and that your experience of it makes it where you want to share it and want to share it faithfully. And so would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we usually start our prayers by speaking your name. And Lord, we ask that we might be truthful with the way we speak about you. Lord, we, we need sometimes reminding of how merciful and gracious you are with us, that we've often fallen short 
of living up to the lives that you call us to, of, of living up to uh, the image of Christ that we are being pulled and transformed into. Lord, in this season of Lent and on this Ash Wednesday, Lord, I ask that while we are thinking about things that we would like to uh, see transformed in our lives, that we might realize that some, sometimes there's things that we think about the way you work in this world. Sometimes there's things we think about you that, that still need transformation. And, and we see you too small. Lord, help us to see your expansive majesty and glory. And help us to live and speak truly about you. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.